Um, so I'll just introduce you to our wonderful guest speaker this morning. Um, it's Georgia Lane. Um, she has lots of things to add to her name um, that keeps her busy. Uh, so she is the president of Women of Influence, which she founded. How long ago was that, Georgia? Uh, 2005, May 2005. Oh, wow. Goodness. Uh, which is a, a non-profit organisation. Um, and together with her committee of volunteers, uh, Women of Influence is delivering events to professional women to connect, learn and grow with over 300 people attending the events. Uh, that was in prior to March 2020, it might have changed a little bit, uh, look a little bit different now. Um, Georgia's business, uh, Fastlane 30 Consulting, is an outsourced marketing business helping business people to build their brands and develop a marketing machine that will stand out, run smoothly, and just keep going. I love the sound of that, and it really ties into the theme this morning of marketing, building a marketing machine, um, that's not going to run out of steam in 2020, 2021. Um, she has de decades of experience in marketing, branding, and business development. And this morning is going to share some tips on how you can tweak your marketing machine, step up to the grid, and be in the race, which sounds fantastic. Um, I just ask um, if you do have a question throughout the Good morning. Uh, if you just pop it in the chat, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but just to so we don't sort of interrupt the flow, I might just bring them up as we go along. Um, yeah, if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. At the end, we might have a little discussion, seeing how we're going for time, and talk about how you do your marketing and not run out of steam. I think at the beginning of the year, it'd be really good to know how to do that. I'm sure we will get the ground running and would like to know how to be successful in our marketing, but how to do it in a way that's efficient, that doesn't burn us out um, and that we can enjoy what we're doing. So Georgia, without further ado, I might pass it over to you. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I guess the topic, Bruce and I talked about it um, and the reasons why we decided to focus on this uh, is because I, I have seen a lot of people run out of steam. Uh, you know, when they're building their marketing machine, they go out all guns blazing uh, and then kind of, you know, it wanes off. Uh, so I wanted to share with you, you know, some of the reasons why I like to build a machine when it comes to marketing. Um, you know, the first thing, of course, is because life does get, you know, that word, we don't like Bruce, busy, <laughs> but it's true. And we've all got other things to do. Um, marketing often is the first thing that falls off. Um, so it's really important just to build a bit of a process so it will run smoothly and um, continue on. Um, and as I said, we go out full speed and then we lose momentum. Uh, and But the other thing, too, it's really important to build consistency uh, because if you are consistent in your approach with your branding and your messaging and who you're targeting, uh, it does build trust because people, you know, when they see the same thing and, and know what they're going to see and they expect to see and it comes up that way, they're not surprised, um, then it does build that level of trust. And if also, of course, if you build brand awareness, um, I guess more than anything, uh, you won't miss opportunities. So, that to me is the big thing with marketing um, is that it's not necessarily, you don't have to be selling all the time. It's just making sure that what you're putting out there and what you've got set up, your website, your platforms, all those sorts of things and making sure that uh, you don't miss opportunities. Um, so just going back to the presentation, this is the, the GT Ford, which I put this in for my son. <laughs> because he's a bit of a car nerd. Um, but it's a good analogy. I think, you know, with anything, whether it's gardening or a car or, you know, fitness, um, if you put in a little bit each day and maintain it, it works really well. You know, you've got to start with a really good structure. Um, but if you don't look after something, then it will fall over. So the five steps, uh, in my view, uh, and this is just based on my years of experience uh, working with different clients and with women of influence, is the five steps are, first of all, starting with who you are 
and who you serve. The second is building a website that works for you. Third, choosing your social platforms. And fourth, planning your program, then creating the content machine. So we'll dive into each of those. And please, um, if you've got any questions, you know, as Bruce said, please just type them in the chat or I think you can raise your hand and I'll see if I can answer it. Otherwise, Bruce, let me know if there's any question that you want me to address. Yep, we'll um, and, you know, please, Bruce, too, also feel free to, to chime in and ask questions. Yep. Um, so starting with um, step one, so knowing who you are and who you serve. Uh, with the analogy of car racing, what is your position on the starting grid? So do you, do you have a story? It's really a good idea to sit down and work out, you know, what your story is, why you're, you're here, uh, what your special skills are. Um, I like to take my clients through, you know, the whole um, vision mission process. Um, a, for example, a vision should be quite a robust description of where you want to be in three to five years. Um, it's probably a couple of pages and basically it'd be if you were to place yourself in the future in three to five years time, what does that look like? And that should be your fuzzy beacon um, that you're always aiming for. Whereas your mission should be, you know, what you do on a daily basis. So starting with that, and then also starting with what your story is with respect to who your target audience is. I call the target audience an avatar. Um, so it's like a perfect being, because I think a lot of clients get caught up in, well, but you know, if I, if I describe my client, um, it's really diverse. So what I say is, well, if you're, if you think of your perfect being, that if you were to put that person into a magic box and press a button and replicate them thousands of times, what would that person look like? And then going into what your goals are as an organisation um, is a good start. And then what your special skill is that answers the questions for those avatars. So just going in further about what who those avatars are and how you create them. Um, and Bruce, you might have something to say on this with respect to, to not-for-profit. Um, or, you know, this network in particular. Basically, the, you know, the way I like to look at it is if you're marketing to everyone, you're marketing to no one. So it's really important that you even design and have a picture of who your target market is. So I didn't mean to have these all, all as men. It was just a, a caricature that I had. Um, but I would, you know, this is an example of one of my clients, AFAN, um, and the typical um, avatar for AFAN is a sort of 40 plus year old professional male. Um, and I, we actually, as far as break down, you know, what their family situation is, what their day-to-day -day life is, um, how much they earn, even, you can even put a name to them in a picture. Uh, and so when you're coming up with your marketing material, uh, writing something, you know, coming up with your program, you think of what that person, who that person is and what their problems are. And it just makes it a little bit easier to then write the material to solve their problems and continue with that branding that you're wanting to put out there. I guess from a, a non-profit point of view, it'd be um, who's, who are the most likely people to support your non-profit and probably what is, what's that value proposition, not just the, like the skill, well, that's probably for a business, but what's that value proposition that you're asking them to buy into or support? Yeah, and, the, and you might have two, like it could be your, the people who are going to donate um, to your organisation. It could also be, I was talking to um, Radfly, our charity, last week, and their avatar is also the beneficiaries. Yeah. Um, so you don't have to necessarily have one avatar or one target audience, but you just have to be very clear on who those avatars are. You probably don't want to have too many, um, you know, one, two or three avatars and then develop programs thinking around them. But in general, unless it's, you know, high level branding, which goes to everyone, if you're creating a campaign, writing an article or doing a video, or um, then you've really got to try and be specific about who that avatar is. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so back to... Step two is all about your website. Um, 
So your website is is the your source of truth. It's your it's your main hub for everything. Um, so you need to have a website that works. So choosing a platform to build your website on is really important. And I'll go into the platform I prefer in a second. Um, of course, the platform needs to be mobile responsive these days. I think most platforms these days are, although I still do see a lot of old websites that aren't mobile responsive, meaning they don't work on you know, any device. Um, and also you need to make sure that the, um, the template that you're using or the, uh, the theme is mobile responsive as well and is updated. Uh, probably one of the most important areas of the website are the About Us page. Um, I know, you know, a, a lot of my experience is in financial services and the About Us page generally takes about 80% of the traffic volume. So I don't know, Bruce, whether it's the same in um, not-for-profit. Would that be right? I'm not actually sure about that. That's a, a good question. Yeah, it's a, well, it's a good starting point because really a website when you start a website, it should be about you. So it's like a business card on steroids. Yeah. So if people hear about you um, and they want to learn more about you, they're going to go to the About Us page on your website. We, we have a researcher in our presence. I'm not sure what you would think, Ruth, would be a popular page on nonprofit websites. I don't know. Um, that's a very good question. Um, You'd have to ask the marketing uh, faculty, yeah, yeah. I reckon. I know that I know that people do actually like to look at boards, see who's on the board, and, and really get that um, that trust in a in a new organisation as well. But of course, you can get analytics, can't you, Georgia? So I mean, you can yes. actually see because it might be different for different people. But um, if yeah. you set up your analytics, we can actually tell ACPNS what pages people are going to and how long they're staying on which pages. Yeah, Correct. It, that's it depends, right. Yeah, if it's a well-known charity, I think people will gravitate to, to different websites. But if it's unknown, they might want to know more about, about the charity and who, um, who governs the charity and their annual reports and all, all those sorts of things. It depends what their purpose is going to the website, I guess. I can tell you something personally. I get very frustrated when I go to the About You and there's pretty much nothing there or it's very fluffy and it doesn't actually tell me who it is that's doing this. Yes. Um, I've done that recently, I think, over the last couple of days, gone to a couple of websites and clicked on the About Us and then it doesn't really tell me. So mm. that puts me off a lot when the about you or the about us page isn't well written yeah i agree yes you want to know that these people have uh, experience um you can trust them you can build a relationship with them so yeah the about us page is really important i mean of course the home page is extremely important too because that's where people are going to come first and if people land on your home page and they're not seeing that it answers their questions or is what they're looking for, then they'll bounce off, which is something that, you know, search engine optimization uh, is bad for that. So, um, you know, there's a lot of aspects to a website that works. Um, the homepage is very important and having an image and a, and a statement that talks to solve the problems or why the people have come to your website. And then of course the About Us page so they can learn what you're about. Um, when I say what you're about, you also have got to be wary of not making being too subjective so people are most interested in themselves and solving their problems um, so the about us page should still answer those questions for them um, the other things that are important about a, a website uh, is that it's you know it's very important for completing the social circle uh, and what I mean by that is you know that it connects with all of your social platforms and allows them to subscribe and um, all of those things. And, and again, all of that is really good for SEO because um, the more link backs that are involved in or on your website, the better. Um, so just on platform, and I'll just put the screen up again. Um, the, so is your website platform open source? Um, so WordPress is my platform of choice. Uh, the reason why I like WordPress is because it is open source. And what that means is that anybody can 
uh, access the the development um, the way that the the uh, platform's been developed. And so what that means is that um, a lot of people out there who are developers and then understand that open source technology can create a, pl a plugin, um, which is kind of like an app for anything you want to do on a website, which is really beneficial. So um, the other thing about that, I suppose the downside is that WordPress websites are very open to being hacked. Um, however, if you keep them, uh, the plugin updates done on a regular basis and have them backed up and secure, um, then that's not going to happen. So, you know, WordPress website, I love them. They're very, very easy to use. There's thousands and thousands of themes out there that you can choose, um, or you, you can either go, you know, a, a pre-built theme, or you can go fully bespoke. Um, you've got a wide, wide range of choices. And then there's all these other platforms and systems that can integrate with it. You know, so whether you want to add something like Shopify or MailChimp feed or, um, you know, a, a chatbot or you know, all those sorts of things that will all be available um, from a developer in the WordPress environment. So that's why I like WordPress. Um, and then just looking at whether your website's doing the basics. You don't, your website doesn't need to be war and peace. It doesn't need to be overly complicated. It should be a fairly simple sitemap. Um, and, you know, that would be the homepage, the About Us page, um, the services you offer, uh, the Contact Us page, a news section, and then, you know, depending on your industry or your area of specialty, you know, what other things you want to add. Um, you can get tricky, of course, later and be adding different um, campaign pages and things like that. But to start off, it should be pretty simple. Um, does it have CTAs? What that means is calls to action. So uh, on each page and each area, um, there should be something for the visitor to do, uh, whether it's subscribe, whether it's contact us. Um, so just at the bottom of each page or in certain areas, um, or even sort of little movable chatbots and things like that, being able to give the, the, um, the visitor the opportunity to, to sign up to your newsletter or contact you or take up your services. So that's really important to have a call to action. Um, as I mentioned before, making sure that your website is secure and that it's backed up. And of course, that it's the hub of all of your communication platforms. So you've got the icons there and you link through to whatever social platforms you're using. And then it's all connected that way. So step three is social platforms. Um, and this is very, it's very industry specific. And it's also, I think, very personal because it's constantly changing. I, I'm a big fan of doing less better um, rather than trying to be on every single social platform that's available. Um, so my background is very much um, professional services, so financial services and law. Um, and so in our industry, it's very much about LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is the predominant platform, social platform that we use. Um, and it's growing every day, you know, since Microsoft bought it, I can't remember how many years ago, um, it's moving all the time. Um, and it's very much about the personal. So a LinkedIn profile, your personal profile, your personal brand is really, really important. Um, and that's, you know, uh, over and above what we're talking about today, building your business brand. It's really important as individuals to build your personal brand on LinkedIn. Of course, you do have a company page um, and groups on LinkedIn, um, but it is very much about, about the individuals. Um, but the good thing about LinkedIn is it's a professional network. So it's not, you know, you're not usually going to get cat videos and things like that. Um, and you can do excellent, excellent searches and campaigns on LinkedIn that can get right down to, you know, locations, job roles, um, salaries, all those sorts of things. So it's quite powerful in that way. Um, of course, Facebook, you know, Facebook is massive. Um, different horses for different courses. We, you know, for, for the law firm that I'm doing a lot of branding for at the moment, we will use Facebook for their conveyancy division. But for other divisions of their business, we won't. Um, for financial services, similar. Um, and for both of those industries, we'll use Facebook groups quite a bit. Um, but we're using Facebook probably to a lesser extent as a business. Um, email marketing and newsletter. So we use MailChimp, but there's lots of different platforms out there. 
Um, so that's another form of, you know, social platform. And it's a very, very powerful one. The benefit, benefit of that is that you own the database, whereas obviously on the, on the social platforms, they could take that away tomorrow. Um, YouTube, uh, we use YouTube a lot. We use it uh, as the basis for our big ticket items, our videos. Um, and is, it is the largest search engine after Google. Uh, and a lot of people use YouTube as a place to learn. So it's a great place to be putting up um, videos to teach people things and then bring them back you know, to your website. And then finally, Instagram. Uh, I'm not going to cover off on TikTok or any of the other, I think Grandstand, the new one, or I can't remember, but there's so many new platforms coming and going um, in, a, in a business environment and for what I'm used to. Uh, we do use Instagram. It's very much image-based and, of course, owned by Facebook anyway. So you can do a lot of stuff that, that spreads to both of them. Um, so, yeah, I think... Um, Bruce, what's your view? Instagram's probably really important in not-for-profit because it's very emotional and people want to see photos. I think that's where you can tell stories a lot, lot more mm. um, and, and uh, get people yeah, emotionally involved in your brand and see what you're doing day-to-day, -day, see what you're doing behind the scenes, I think. We've got yeah. a question, um, Georgia, uh, from Bobby Lee. Um, just regarding LinkedIn, how do you brand yourself if you wear a few different hats? And I know, I know a few of us here probably do that. So that would be great to know your experience. Yeah, it's interesting because LinkedIn is very much a personal branding platform. Um, it is difficult to do that. Uh, I mean, so for my clients, I have several um, LinkedIn profiles, but they're like company pages within my profile. Um, and so, you know, I manage all of the LinkedIn company pages within my LinkedIn profile, but I do focus on my own personal brand. Um, and what I do, I do try to, you know, put out there that marketing and branding is my thing. And the summary will, is the, the area of your LinkedIn profile that helps you do that. Um, so when people land on your LinkedIn profile, your summary should tell them, you know, of those avatars, what it is you're doing for them. Um, and if you are wearing different hats, um, it can get complicated, but you're probably still doing the same thing, I would hope, for, for all those different um, types of businesses. Um, does, does that make sense? Can, feel free to chat, um, Bobby Lee. So, for example, with my, I, I'm a bit like you, Bobby Lee. Um, you know, I, I, I run Women of Influence, um, I have Fastlane, and then I also represent a lot of my clients as their marketing manager. But when you go to my LinkedIn profile, uh, it talks very much about marketing and branding, because essentially that's what I do for Women of Influence, for my clients and for Fastlane. Um, and then the stuff that I share on LinkedIn um, I'm not, to, to be honest, personally, I'm not as active on LinkedIn as my clients are. So I tend to teach them how to build their personal brand more and develop their company pages more than I do my own. Anyway, hope that answers your question. Um, sorry, Georgia. Um, Bruce just, hi, it's Bobby Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce just said that, um, that I could jump on and um, okay. ask a further question. So, um, even though I do kind of do the same thing, there, there is different target markets because, for instance, one of the things that I do is I'm a filmmaker, um, so I produce my own, my own work and I'm doing a um, feature documentary about women's health. So there's project-based filmmaker Bobby Lee and then I'm a festival director of a women's online film festival, um, which I'm at the moment pushing out for call for entries and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's very separate. And then I've got an academic cut that I work part-time at the Griffith Film School. So, and I do um, as a freelancer. So there's my filmmaker project, my own projects, but then I work as a freelancer for other people in producing or marketing for film or impact work, impact producing. So there's, that's the gamut. So I don't know how to um, push that out without diluting any of those. Sure. So your, I mean, your, your underlying theme is obviously filmmaking. 
Um, so talking very much about, you know, what your special skill is with filmmaking and your, your experience and the type of people you tend to work with and connect would be what you would focus on in your summary. But then you can put up in your profile examples of the projects you work on. So you can put up, um, you know, one of your films or a short version of it. Um, you know, you can, demo, you, can, you, you can put onto LinkedIn lots of things that show the different projects that you work on. Um, and then if you wanted to delve deeper into talking to those individual groups, you can actually set up groups. So LinkedIn has the opportunity where you can set up a group um, that just talks to those specific people. If you're going to do a group on LinkedIn, it is, it is quite um, an all engaging thing because the benefit of a group is starting conversations and continuing conversations. But what that it can allow you to do is focus on, you said you've got a, um, a women's health group. Um, so I'm doing a feature documentary on women's health. Okay. And then I'm doing, um, I'm a festival director of a women's online film festival. Mm, okay. Um, so. Like you guys should get together. Yeah, yeah, for women of influence. Actually, yeah, women of influence would be yeah. a good connect. Yeah. Yes, and I love I love film. Um, video is a huge part of what I do with my marketing. Um, I just think it's such a great medium for communicating. So yes, we'll have to talk, Bobby Lee. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, it, it's probably um, something that you know. One of the things that I always recommend to my clients to do is to do their own personal branding first. Um, so one of the organisations I do a lot of work for is called Brand New You. Um, if you look them up, you'll see they're based in Sydney. Um, they're a personal branding organisation. And what we do is we step you through a process where um, you do your via strengths, which is working out what your top strengths are as an individual. Uh, and then you write your LinkedIn profile and your About Us page and everything based on those. So you're very much putting out there. So one of my strengths, for example, my top three are zest. So everything I do, I do with energy um, and I, I try to do things well. Um, bravery and honesty. So when I you know, write, you'll see on my LinkedIn profile, I talk very much about that and how that benefits you know, women of influence and my clients and so on. So it's very much about, you know, uh, building that personal brand and then putting that out there to the various people that you help and talk with. But when you want to break it down to your individual avatars, then that might be by way of specific campaigns or posts that you put out there or actually setting up groups and talking with them separate to your general LinkedIn profile. Okay. Thank you. No Thanks, Bobby Lee. Um, I'll just go into step four now. Uh, so step four is going into then creating um, your plan, your program. Um, so we've gone through, um, you know, understanding who you are. So you've, you've looked at what your goals are, you understand who your avatar is, um, you've got your website working, uh, you've chosen some social platforms you're going to work with. Now it's about um, creating what the, the program's going to look like um, for the next 12 months. So I've just done this for a couple of my clients. Um, I like to do it sort of December, January, because in our industry, we don't sort of tend to go back to work until end of January, beginning of February. So um, I recommend that you actually set time aside, um, probably like at least three hours, to just really think about what you want to achieve for the year. Um, very much focusing on who your target market is, uh, what you want to achieve with them. And then you can sort of start breaking it down to, you know, what the themes, dates, events and things are for the year. Um, and you can do all of this. I, I tend to use a Google sheet um, or like an Excel spreadsheet, but you can start off with just a blank sheet of paper or a whiteboard is a really good place to start. Um, if 12 months is too overwhelming, I tend to create a three-month rolling calendar for my clients and I'll break it down by week commencing and come up with a main theme at the top uh, and then work out how often I want to be, you know, creating a big ticket item and then posting and then sort of break it down from there. Um, one of the great ways to, um, to start with, you know, working out what your programs and content is going to be is answering the frequently asked questions that your target market is coming to you with. So 
if there's a particular, you know, you could sit down and write down five questions that you get asked all the time by either your um, the people donating or your beneficiaries, then you've got all of a sudden, you know, five frequently asked questions and five topics that you can answer. Remember that with all of your content, um, you should be thinking about what the call to action is. And this can be really simple. So it might be whatever you do, you want them to either subscribe to your, um, your database or you want them to contact you or you want them to donate. Uh, and then once you've sort of got this framework in place, you're then gonna have a start, start thinking about what platforms you're going to be creating this program on. Um, so just to give you an idea of what that would look like, like from a basic um, lead funnel, the way that you would look at this, for example, at the bottom um, would be, you know, this is how uh, information would come through from all the various platforms and then filter through to the call to action. Um, so the way this might work, for example, is uh, you would post something on your website and then you would use that post to, so if you build, you're building these arrows up here, you might post something on your website like a, a video or um, a blog, an article, and then you would use, say, the first couple of paragraphs of that, that article um, or the description that you would put on YouTube for the video um, as a, a first paragraph for your newsletter, so that's another arrow. Uh, and then you would use that information then to post on LinkedIn or Facebook uh, and then you would publish on your LinkedIn personal page. And then basically all of that information would lead back to your website or your call to action. Um, so that's the way I sort of would, would structure a marketing program. Uh, and when I'm thinking about all the different moving parts that then end up to your the, the funnel down here to you. So whether that's um, contacting you, making a donation, um, or just adding your de their details to your database. I think you make a really good point, Georgia, um, about uh, your website being the hub of of your business or your nonprofit, and even because um, that's where everyone goes in the end, almost. Um, yes. And even with uh, charities that do fundraising, they're sending out direct mail, um, or you might have a TV ad or um you're running an event everyone will be going to your website like if if they get a direct mail and they're wanting to donate that a lot of people are now are starting to google so everything is funneling into your website so it's so important to have that working and think think of things in like that funnel that everyone's coming to your website not things working in silos or on their own it's oh we're just focusing on this channel everything is is going to the website and working symbiotically I think that's true go, yeah, the, yeah there's it's not to say that the traditional forms of marketing and advertising are gone um, certainly you know a direct mail piece is very important they're probably just a lot simpler these days because the main bulk of the information will be on the website so it's, you know, appealing to somebody's emotions, getting them to act, is acting, either finding you on social media or going to your website and then, you know, what happens next. Yeah. That's right. Um, I guess, you know, on that note, um, it's different horses for different courses. So um, one thing I really believe in, and that's why I show that final funnel and talk about all the different steps in marketing, is that people want to consume things in different ways. So it, it is important to use a variety of platforms. Um, it is, you know, as we we're just talking about, Bruce, you know, appealing to people's emotions and solving their problems. Um, and then, of course, building the brand. So one thing that I'm, I believe in wholeheartedly is understanding what your brand is and uh, making sure that that look is consistent throughout everything you do. Um, so that, you know, whether it's on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, your website, or a direct mail piece, it all should look similar, um, be, you know, the same colours, the same fonts, the same sort of similar sort of images and phrases and wording. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of things that it should definitely do as well, which is dem demonstrate your expertise or um, show, you know, um, some social proof or um, all those sorts of things that are building up to that, that emotional connection and building the trust. 
Um, the other thing is that we know with all the different platforms is it's it's communicating and engaging with people. So, you know, as opposed to, I guess, the old traditional um, advertising and marketing ways of doing things, these, way, these days it's very much about it communicating and engagement as well. Um, so keeping that in mind, and that's why we have to have all these different various platforms. Um, and the other thing that I believe in too is repurposing. So... Um, you know, I was talking to Bobby Lee before about how I love video. Um, so I use video quite a bit where I'll, you know, film one of my clients talking about something or something that they solve for their clients. And then I'll use that to break it down into different forms of content. So, you know, we do a webinar as a starting point and then we'll turn that into a, a micro video. Um, and then we'll transcribe that to turn it into a blog. Um, which we can then use the wording for posts. So, you know, I'm a big believer in, in repurposing content as much as you can, and that's what builds that, that ongoing machine. Um, so step five uh, is getting, getting into that content machine. So I think I've probably touched on that quite a bit, um, but this is, you know, the importance of building the machine is having a bit of a process that allows you to produce something that can then be developed on various platforms um, for the different ways people want to consume. But of course, is all, you know, um, I guess, tying in with your overall message and your brand. So the way I do that um, is uh, to create the content machine is I start with that big ticket item. So as I mentioned, quite often for me, it would be a video or it could be an article. So what we often do is we'll, um, you know, get somebody to sit down and write some bullet points on a um, particular topic or subject, like, you know, in, in my industry, in, in financial planning, for example, estate planning, what are the five tips um, or five steps to get your estate planning and wills in line? Um, and then we would break that down. So that's a big ticket item. And then we would then turn that into emails and newsletters, posts. Uh, we can use the big video and turn them into micro videos because people are not really interested in going back and watching a big long video, but you can take a piece out uh, and they can watch it on LinkedIn or Facebook, you know, one or two minutes. Um, create curated content as well. Um, you know, I think people have different views on this, but if you, you know, Bruce shared some fantastic articles with me this week, um, which I really enjoyed reading. And I would never have known about those platforms or articles if he hadn't have shared that with me um, because that's, you know, he, he knows those platforms in not-for-profit. Um, so by sharing that, it's not saying that he, it's, he doesn't have to have his, write his own content all the time. It's just showing that this is my area of expertise. This is what I know wholeheartedly. And I'm going to share this with my network um, because they probably don't necessarily know about those things. So um, curating content uh, is a big part of building up your know, like, trust and demonstrating your, your expertise. Um, graphics. So I use um, Canva which is, you know, it's a free platform. I actually pay for it for the extra features, but you can do some fantastic stuff on, on Canva to create the graphics that then match with the content that you're posting out there. It's very quick and easy. There's lots of tools and images and things that you can use. Um, and again, it, it, you can also build up your branding and put in your colors and all that sort of stuff. Um, Letters, you know, certainly a not-for-profit. Um, I think, you know, a personal letter is definitely not a lost art form. Um, and because we receive so many emails and, you know, are bombarded with social media, um, things like letters uh, can be a huge part of connecting with people. And, of course, you know, phone calls. Like years ago I was a, a salesperson um, and we used to have uh, what we would call an hour of power. Um, I think, you know, it is very much a lost art form where you can do things like that. It all goes back to the same thing. It's the same goals, vision, message, branding, and thinking about your target market. But if you send a letter out to somebody and then set aside a time to do an hour of power and get on the, um, the phone and call two or three people once a week, it's a really powerful thing. So that's just an extension of creating content. Um, this is just an example. I just wanted to show you uh, an example of how I create a content machine for one of my clients. So I've talked about 
AFAN. Um, you can jump on and have a look at their uh, website. Can you see their website now on the screen? Yeah. Yep. So that's what we actually do with them. So to create their content machine, um, so their homepage, um, you know, the target market is financial advisors. But one of the things that we do, we create on uh, regular events, which we were going to do live events, um, but we switched with COVID to doing webinars. And we now do fortnightly events um, on Zoom. And what that does is um, each of the, the specialists in the organisation will then do... Um, so let's look at what Paul's done. He's done a webinar about aged care. So we just interviewed him. We got him to talk about, you know, what, what considerations Australians perhaps might need to make when putting uh, their parents in aged care. We just filmed them. And then I used that. I've posted it on YouTube. Um, I've placed it on the website with the description, which is great for SEO. Uh, and then what I've done is um, transcribed that broken it down into four topics and provided that to a writer to write four articles. Uh, and then that's my content for the next month. Um, so that's just an example of how you can use um, a machine like that to create ongoing content, which, which works really well. Um, yeah, so let's see what else we've got. Oh, I'll just show you two, just lastly, an example of what my content plan looks like um, and that's again for this organization a fan so you know how I talked before about um, coming up with that three month uh, rolling calendar and then how I break that down so I start with the week the week commencing put in the date I talk about what the main area of focus is going to be and who the person is that we're going to focus on uh, and then I start putting in things like awareness dates or um, calendar dates, you know, like Australia Day, World Cancer Day, Chinese New Year. And you can start a, sort of start breaking themes down. Um, if you were to go down further, you would also see that I've gone onto a quotes website and picked some quotes um, that sort of link back to either the main theme or Australia Day or those sorts of things. So that's um, just a way that I put together the content calendar and I will sit down and set aside sort of half a day once a quarter, put that in place um, so that I've got a three month rolling calendar and then I'll get down to more detail on a um, week to week basis or with other clients, I do it fortnightly. So yeah, so that is how um, I work to create the content machine. Um, and just like, you know, I was saying with a car, if you work on it a little bit each day or gardening or keeping fit, um, if you've got sort of the main structure in place and you work on it a little bit each day, then you can keep it going. And if you know what your branding is, if you know who your target market is and what you want to achieve, it just makes it easier just to continue on and not run out of steam. So that's it. Has anybody got any questions or? Fantastic. That's so great, uh, Georgia. Do we have any questions um, directly for Georgia? Nope. Mm. No, I think um, Georgia inspires women, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, what was that, Ben Hill? I said, Women normally inspiring women, but in this occasion, you inspire men, and, and <laughs> yeah. yeah, not just women of influence, men of influence too. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Good um, on you. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm just what, what I'd really love to know is how how people here uh, organize themselves with their marketing. Um, how they keep themselves on track and not running out of steam. Like what are some, maybe some tools that you use or if you're laying out your planning like Georgia uh, showed us there at the end, like what, what do you do um, practically? I might just show you some, a few little tools because I really like these to get super practical um, with some little takeaways. Um, 
one that I'm really excited about getting into using, and you, you might love this as well, um, Georgia, it's called Airtable. Um, and it has a whole lot of um, templates and things that you can use, but you can actually visually like upload um, images to it. Um, and you can see it, see things in different views. So Bruce, it's Bobby yeah. Lee. Is that like Canva? No, so this isn't this isn't Canva. Uh, this isn't like Canva. It's more of a way of mapping out sort of your content calendar. Um, does it post? Like, does it schedule? No, it doesn't sh schedule. But in a sense, it's a way for you to sort of lap, uh, lay it all out, so you sort of know what's coming up. Yeah. Um, and you can also look at it as a, like a Gantt chart, um, like that. Um, you can do it in a, in a Kanban view. So you could have like a list of content that you're kind of brainstorming or putting together. Like Georgia was saying, you know, you, you're gathering those quotes or things that you might then like move into like uh, polishing into a design. Um, then you can do approval, all sorts of things. You can sort of really... Um, personalize it the way that you want. You can add a calendar of all dates. So it's sort of like Excel, but a little bit on steroids. Um, another one which we've probably harp, I've harped on before about is Trello, um, which is kind of quite similar, but it's a bit more in a um, sort of using cards and things. Um, so open this one up for you. So yeah, you sort of map things out and you can add your pictures. You can um, type in the content. So it's sort of like mapping something out that if you've got someone that does your social media, they can um, quickly go to a post, they can see the picture, they can pull out the, the text on that picture and, and post. Um, and you can uh, put due dates on things and all sorts of stuff like that. So what else, what else do people use? Um, oh, another one just while I'm here is um, Asana is is what I we use at my current job um, for uh, sort of mapping out your work. Um, so you can sort of see when you're working on things and what's reliant on other things. So that's really good way to keep us on track. Um, but yeah, I'm keen to know what you guys use or how you're sort of functioning or managing at the moment. I know we've got a few people here that do work in marketing or rely on people to do marketing. So how, how do you guys work uh, to keep yourself organized and uh, not run out of steam? Um, Bruce, just uh, Ruth was asking too, if we could talk about hashtags and tagging people. Oh, sure. Um, did you want me to talk about that or do you want to? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Uh, I guess different platforms work differently. Well, uh, yes and no. Um, LinkedIn, for example, uh, it's really great to tag people on LinkedIn uh, because LinkedIn, the algorithm very much likes when you start conversations and have conversations. Um, I mean, you could put some great stuff on LinkedIn and if you don't have conversations or have comments in the feed, then nobody will see it. That's kind of how it works. So really important when you are posting something on LinkedIn that you tag other people um, who you know will relate or be interested in it. So, for example, um, if I was putting something out about our next Women of Influence event, which Dr. Ruth is going to be our keynote speaker, <laughs> um, if I was to... Um, to write an article saying, you know, uh, our next event is on the 12th of March and we're very honoured to have Dr. Ruth. I would, when I'm writing in the post, I would do the at symbol and then Dr. Uh, Ruth, start typing that and LinkedIn will bring up her name. Uh, and then what that does is it'll, it'll show her that I've written a post which includes her. And then if she comments back, then every time anybody else comments, then that will all go into their feed. It's really great for um, showcasing your LinkedIn profile to other people in other networks. So if somebody then, you know, who's, who's connected with Dr. Ruth sees that post, which they will because um, it'll go into their feed, 
then all of a sudden I'm connected with that person and so on and so forth. Um, so that's, I guess, one thing about tagging people. Similarly on Facebook and uh, Instagram, um, it's, it's a great way to encourage engagement and expose yourself, I guess, to other people within that social platform. So that's tagging people. Um, hashtags is a little bit different. So hashtags um, is more like a theme um, that you can relate to uh, when writing and people will tend to search hashtags or if people are, are following certain hashtags, if you include that hashtag in your post, then that will also appear in their feed. Um, you can also do some clever stuff with hashtags. So if you create, you know, with our The Great Debate, which we did last year, we had a hashtag, The Great Debate 2020. Um, and that uh, by using that hashtag and getting our guests and our virtual guests to use that hashtag, we could then use that at, um, with a, it was like a Twitter feed, but using Instagram. So at the event, whenever, whenever people use that hashtag, we could then feed that onto the, the big screens in the room and people on Instagram could then also see what other people were doing if they used that hashtag. Um, I also use hashtags for research. So, um, you know, on LinkedIn, for example, I'll type in estate planning, hashtag estate planning to see what other articles are around to give me some inspiration for producing content or I'll follow the hashtag um, to, fit, to see what people are doing yeah, in that area of interest. Um, I mean, it can, there's so much to hashtags and tagging people, but that's probably an introductory course. <laughs> Does anybody else have comments on hashtagging and tagging people? Um, I think just probably in a similar vein, like if you're about to do some posting on Instagram, I'm not sure if this works on other platforms, but I've heard a little, a little um, tip is that if you're about to post, um, it's a good idea to actually spend a bit of time actually liking and commenting on things beforehand, because that sort of shows Instagram that you're not just in it for your, yourself, you kind of get some sort of algorithm. I don't know all the details, but I've, I've heard of people making sure they spend a bit of time liking a few things, commenting before they actually post, which will help um, Instagram uh, like what you're doing a little bit more. <laughs> uh, Bobby, yeah, Bobby Lee's just asking if there are any free post schedulers. I don't know of any. Um, uh, Joel's just mentioned Loomly which looks really good. It looks like you can map out your uh, social media on there, but I know most of them would be, would have a price associated with them. Um, it is worth checking out appsumo.com because uh, normally you can get lifetime deals for um, platforms that are sort of just coming out and trying to gain some momentum. Um, so I think they do have one on there that you sort of pay a one-off fee rather than spending a monthly fee. So you might spend $50 to get something for a lifetime, which is really a uh, good value. So if you jump on AppSumo, I think there is one um, that will do social media posting for you. So just check that out. I can't remember the name of it off, off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, anyone else that um, want to share sort of what they do to keep on track of their marketing. Don't be shy. I'm sure you've got some amazing tips that we don't know about. Um, I'll add to the conversation. I'm not going to say that I am keeping on track with my marketing at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very hard. Um, so as a festival director, I'm trying to um, do a call out for interns and volunteers to kind of I guess you, you do the plan and then you push yeah. it out to help to get other people on board. Um, just two other marketing things that I'm doing, which might help other people, um, is targeting specific target markets. So say a film is, um, so I'm spe specifically talking about film marketing, but I think it, I think it can translate. Um, so I did a um, marketing for a film about um, the Holocaust. I'm doing one about the Holocaust at the moment. And I did one about, it was uh, for a Hungarian Australian filmmaker. And it was um, also about the revolution in Hungary 
and the aftermath of that and, and an Australian going back to Hungary. So then I thought, okay, who's going to be interested in this film? Who, who's the target market? Like who's the converted and who's not the converted mm. that you need to. Um, so the converted is like, okay, Hungarian organizations, Hungarian um, Facebook groups, Hungarian restaurants to sponsor. Um, then you've got multicultural associations um, and refugee um, associations and organizations of which my friend happened to be one. So um, I said, hey, in your conference, do you want to play this film? Um, that kind of thing. And then I got invited all the heads of all those organizations to the film premiere at the Sydney Film Festival because the long tail is to actually go around and do community screenings and those people and those organizations are going to be the who have marketing lists of their own um, are going to be the one who will help organize those individual screenings mm. so it, it's um basically and with the film festival i'm going okay well we have an awards category for music video and for animation i don't know any of those people because i'm more in short film and documentary so it's like, okay, well, what organisations are there? Can they post about the call for entries? Can music mags, let's put it. So that's how I'm I'm doing my marketing is just targeting right. the specifics. That's mm. awesome. Yeah, that's Very good. good. Yeah, and I think it, it's good to do that, you know, that really broad brainstorm of who you can market to. Um and then you'll find the ones that work. I think you kind of got to flare out and then go, okay, that's too much now. These these ones on the on the outside aren't going to perform, but let's bring it in now. Um, yeah, or else you will run out of steam if you try to, to, to go. Yeah, so because we're more film and and, and doco based, we did concentrate on that. And yeah. now it's like, holy shit, there's five days to the entries, and we've only got like nine animations we need to yeah so we kind of did a capacity of what's the most important now let's do what we need to yeah oh that's great um i'm just thinking i might uh hone my question a bit more what what frustrates you in marketing the most at the moment that you like have a burning question of how to just solve a process or something that you just want to nail this this year Anybody? <laughs> I'll jump in if nobody else does. Sorry. I used to do social media for corporates. Um, and my big question was, um, like, I couldn't, I couldn't kind of do it anymore because I couldn't see the return on investment for customers. Yeah for corporates like because their bottom line is I want to sell something whereas if you're kind of kind of tr cr creating a community for a non-profit that's a I think a different goal on social media yeah. um, yeah. so Georgia I was just wondering if if is there return on investment on spending a lot of time on social media uh it depends yeah it depends on what you're trying to achieve I mean um I don't think you can not do social media. Uh, as I was saying, it's different horses for different courses. Um, it's important to have a presence on social media. Um, and so I don't think you can, it's more, you can't afford not to do it. Uh, as far as spending money on paid advertising, um, is that what you mean? Or just actually spending time on social media? Well, um, I guess because it, it does take a lot of time, but no, in the sense of a corporate paying, like someone like me to do mm -hmm. their to spend three hundred and fifty, six hundred dollars a month mm. on their social media, and then go, where's my return on investment? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I guess you you know your return on investment would be. Um, looking at what the KPIs are, what the um, key performance indicators are up front and agreeing on that first. So saying to them, well, if you're going to invest in social media, what do you want to achieve? And they might say, well, we want um, to get to a new market or 
uh, we want to raise awareness or um, we want to, um, you know, move our number of followers um, from X thousand to this thousand, or we want to increase engagement. Um, so being upfront in the first instance to say, yeah. this is what we want to achieve, and then being able to measure what the return on investment is. Yeah. Um, but saying, you know, am I going to spend $500 a month on social media? Is that a good, is there going to be a good return investment? It's too broad a statement, I guess. Um, well, I think like those, I call them soft things and hard things. The hard thing is I want to sell two tractors per month. Mm. I think it's, you know, um, what you're saying about the goals and corporates kind of go talk about goals and KPIs in dollar values, mm. not in building awareness or like it makes total sense of getting into a tar another target market. Mm. But the goal of I want to sell more products, mm -hmm. I want a dollar value return, I don't, I don't think that's possible to, to do. Well, it's, it's, um, it's a sum of all parts still. So the social media um, question is, well, it has to, you do have to have a presence on social media if you're going to have um, some clout as a brand and particularly as a corporate. Um, how to measure the return on investment? Will it be looking at the entire campaign and then what part the social media plays in that? And then if they really want to get down further, as I said, having those really specific um, key result areas or KPIs. So we, we looked at it for Women of Influence, for example. Um, we don't have a huge social media following. We've got a very loyal database. Um, and every time we you know, promote a new event, we get lots of people um, coming to the event. Whereas we wanted to grow our social media presence last year because we did our first virtual event. Um, so when I hired a, um, a VA or a marketing coordinator, I asked her to have, we gave her very specific goals. So we wanted to broaden our regional reach um, and we also wanted to increase engagement, so have more conversations. Um, and then we also wanted to increase the number of followers. So over a, a certain period of time, and it has to be over a long time, you can't expect that it's going to happen overnight, um, over a long period of time, um, she was able to achieve those things. So then you can say, yes, the return on investment was there. Yeah, yeah, and it can be a, a real slow burn. Depend, it depends on the client and it depends on their audience at the time. Mm. And, um, but I think too, like social, it's the way you sell it too. It's like you could go spend, uh, you know, 10 times the social media budget on a billboard, but you can measure very little yes. from the cost of a billboard. But yeah. you can share so many more insights and learnings even from social media. Um, but it's still, yeah, it's still going to really um, hit those top parts of the funnel and you might get a few conversions from it or it might take time to get those mm. conversions. But it's all about development. It's not all about selling. And if, if all you do on your social media is sell, 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 people will unfollow they want to know the story. They want to know why before um, they you, you go in for the kill and go straight <laughs> straight for it. Um, just conscious we've um, just yeah, over eight o'clock. I just want to thank everybody, um, especially Georgia, for her wonderful insights this morning. I hope you feel energised for the year ahead with your marketing. Thank you so much, Georgia, and thank you for everyone for con contributing as well. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to um, flick me an email. Um, happy to help out where I can, when I can. And I'm sure Georgia would love to have a chat with you, especially the wonderful women of influence that we have in this room this morning. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And I just want to thank you for coming along. I hope you have a wonderful day. And I'll let you know about the next meetup that we have uh, in the next month or two. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a Yay. great day. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>